In many parts of the Midwest, an ongoing drought has forced ranchers to cull their herds and sell cattle prematurely as the grass fails to grow and forage crops become scarce. Water sources also run low and dry up, requiring extra time and expense to haul it to pastures. Farmers, too, face additional challenges with changing weather patterns, planting their crops in soil lacking sufficient moisture to help the seeds they plant germinate and grow, and too often watching helplessly as their crops slowly wither in the fields, with kernels of grain in the seed heads shriveling in the heat, reducing yields and farm income. Hi, I'm Dave Kendall of Prairie Hollow Productions, a fifth generation Kansan whose family started farming here in the 1850s. While drought remains a serious problem for today's food producers, they also must contend with intense thunderstorms that can wash away valuable topsoil as rain runs quickly off fields instead of soaking in. And it's not just farmers and ranchers with their crops and livestock being adversely impacted by atmospheric conditions. Those living in cities and towns also have to deal with more severe weather on this warming planet. My friend Rex Buchanan, former director of the Kansas Geological Survey, and my wife, Laura Mead, joined me to speak with a number of different people who shared their unique perspectives on the situation we're in. Come along with us on this journey as we explore the impact of climate change on our part of the Great Plains looking at what's being done to help deal with the challenges posed by increasing temperatures and extreme weather events. We're facing some hot times in the heartland. You might want to sit up and take note as we hear from some of the folks most tuned in to what's happening. This program is made possible with support from Diane Shoemaker, encouraging creative, compassionate, and equitable solutions to the challenges we face. By the R.M. Jory Donor Advised Fund, in memory of Carol A. Jory. By Richard Porter and Porter Cattle Company. By the Nature Conservancy in Kansas. And by Footprints in Lawrence. Welcome to the News Hour. New findings out tonight show the main cause of the climate crisis is rapidly getting worse. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere hit record levels in the spring, the highest in more than four million years. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration also reports the buildup of the heat trapping gas is accelerating. Does NOAA have an official position on climate change? Oh yeah, yeah, and it matches what the National Climate Assessment says. And the National Climate Assessment very, very quickly is something that Congress mandated that we do every four or five years. And so since about 1990, maybe a little after that, we've put out reports, we being all the federal agencies, academics and private industry have worked together to put these out. We're in the midst of one now. And that is sort of accumulated information on how our climate has changed and is changing and looking to future impacts as well as current impacts of what's going on. One of the things we see is the number of record high temperatures that we're hitting far outpaces record low temperatures. There's a definite trend. There's lots of proxy, if you call it proxy data, that really tells us these things. Glaciers melting you know, in certain areas a lot and, and actually fading away over time oceans warming, acidity levels in the ocean uh, increasing, sea level rise, things like that. People in the Midwest probably sort of look at that and go, well, that's not my problem. But flooding events are. Right. And so that manifestation, while maybe not as inexorable or clear, is certainly considerable, right? Well, there's, let's take Katrina, for example, in 2005. It was you know, pretty devastating in New Orleans. And what was it a few years after that? Harvey in, in Houston. I happen to know people that have moved from a coastal area to this area uh, for lots of reasons, right? But part of it was they were displaced. 
by sea level rise combined with a, a, a major storm like a hurricane or something like that and they didn't have a place to live. So there is what we call climate migration and that's going, around, going on around the world as well. Places uh, getting too wet, too dry, uh, too hot, that's happening around the world. It's, it's a semi-political issue too, obviously, but that's a manifestation of, of, of climate change for sure. But my job is more to inform adaptation and resilience methodology. In other words, saying, well, it's going to be 10 degrees warmer in 100 years. Uh, so what are you going to do about it? Or what can we do about it? Because we're already built, it's already built in. The mitigation thing, we need to get to mitigation. Mitigation meaning we need to get uh, all this carbon dioxide out of the air. Okay, one way or the other. But we've built in 100 to 1,000 years of warming already. So even if we had zero man-made, if you will, uh, gases, we're still gonna see rising temperatures for a while. That's built in because the oceans are like a, a bank, if you will. What we're talking about now more than mitigation is adaptation. So what are we gonna do about it? We're gonna build bigger uh, air conditioners or, or what? You know, uh, Do we need to build more places for people to go to stay out of the heat? Uh, when we have these record high temperatures, we've always had record highs sometimes during the year. Uh, what? When you experience those now, you're probably getting a taste of what your kids and grandkids are gonna be feeling much more often than we are right now, okay? So that's one way to think about personal impact. It's not all about us. It's about us and future generations too. How much time do you spend dealing with people who deny that climate change has even taken place? Or if it has, that yeah. it's anthropogenic? So it's a great question. And um, there's a couple of different angles on this. One is, if I get on an airplane and fly somewhere, I'll sit next to somebody, I'll tell them what I do, and they'll ask me, hey, do you believe in climate change? I get that question a lot. Do you believe in climate change? The key word there is believe, right? And my answer to that is, well, you know, to me, it's not, for, for me, it's not a belief system. I understand the science behind climate. I know what's happening around the world. I can look at the temperatures, I can look at the precipitation. Um, and yeah, uh, it, it, it is, it's not a belief though, it's what the science tells me is happening. You know, people don't deny climate change is happening, but some would argue whether it's human-induced or natural cycles. In my mind, it's pretty clear that humans are affecting it and I can show the data for that. A professor of agronomy at Kansas State University, Chuck Rice was nominated to serve on an international team of scientists as part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. He served as a lead author on the IPCC's review of agriculture's impact on climate change in its reports issued in 2007 when it was a co-recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize and 2014. There's actually three reports, the science of climate change, um, impacts and the adaptation, and then the third report, which is one I was involved in, was the ag chapter and how it's potential to mitigate. So we were looking at, we're not developing new science, but reviewing the science and synthesizing it to look at how agriculture could uh, help mitigate climate change. So we were looking at uh, basically carbon sequestration in soils, which is my area of research. Uh, what's the potential? How do you manage soils to increase carbon content to help offset carbon emissions? So in effect, the work you do with the panel doesn't represent new research so much as a review of existing research synthesis trying to come up with a, a consensus based on what's right. been published. Right. People have this misunderstanding that we're developing new science and coming up with new conclusions. Really our job is to take the global literature and try to synthesize it and interpret it from a global perspective. As scientists like Chuck Rice continue to monitor global events and trends, the most recent report issued by the IPCC came out with an urgent warning much more alarming than any of its previous reports. 
The new report from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, found that within a decade, the world is likely to miss its goal of holding global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. If or when the planet reaches that level, scientists say Earth will pass tipping points that will lead to catastrophic environmental damage, including dangerous sea level rise, entire species going extinct, and even greater suffering in many nations, especially the poorest. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the time to act is now. Humanity is on thin ice, and that ice is melting fast. Ice really is melting all around the Earth. A professor of geology at the University of Kansas, Lee Stearns has been studying the dynamics of glaciers and ice sheets in a number of different places, including Antarctica and Greenland. We spoke with her remotely during a period in which she was away from campus. One of the things I would like to start with is maybe help people understand why Greenland is so important. How come you hear so much about Greenland when it comes to this whole issue? My first trip to Greenland was in 2005 as a PhD student, and I'd been studying actually this glacier in the back, Helheim Glacier in East Greenland, for my dissertation, and had been looking at imagery of where the terminus was and, and how it looked for, I guess, for the preceding 15 years, for however long we had good satellite imagery. And then when we got there, it had retreated four miles from, from the place where it had been stable for the previous 20 years. And, and that was a really new discovery then, that it could change in a year that quickly. And we also know by looking at other geologic evidence that it has not retreated this far back in at least thousands of years. So it is definitely out of the ordinary what we're seeing now in Greenland. So that's why Greenland has been getting a lot of press. I guess I also assume just sheer size in this process in terms of, of Greenland. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, Antarctica holds more ice in it. If all of Antarctica melts, it's 32 meters of sea level rise. If all of Greenland melts, it's seven meters of sea level rise. So it is the smaller ice sheet, but it's the one that's much more susceptible to melt. I mean, it's a huge ice sheet changing more quickly than Antarctica is. And nobody's saying that that the whole thing is going to melt anytime soon. But as we know, very small changes have very large societal impacts. And so, you know, even if it's an increase in a in a millimeter from, from one area, that has kind of large scale effects, even for Kansas. You know, we're not worried about flooding from sea level rise, but in terms of ocean circulation, driving some of our weather patterns, in terms of sea level rise impacting the U.S. ports and economy and globally, I think 80% of goods around the world are moved by ship. And so we need ports that are stable and not susceptible to flooding at an increased rate. And so Greenland might feel very far removed, but it's very closely connected to a lot of systems that we depend on. Yeah, and you know this probably better than I do, but in geology, you get that uh, climate change is nothing new conversation. You hear that all the time. Mm -hmm. But what I think is new is that rate of change thing, right? Yes, I, I mean, I don't have the number in front of me, but it's something like, you know, throughout geologic time, it would take 500 or 1,000 years to warm. You know, during the warming cycles, it would take 1,000 years to warm a degree. And now we can do that in 50 years. And again, when I started 20 years ago, we really thought that glaciers responded slowly to a changing climate, you know, that they would slowly kind of get thinner and retreat. And, and it's been pretty new science to observe them changing very quickly, really calving off large chunks at a time, thinning 100 meters in a year in some glaciers, those were not expected. And so a lot of the focus in trying to understand kind of current rates of sea level rise and how the ice sheets are contributing to that and how that's going to change, you know, in the next 50 to 100 years, really rely on how quickly Greenland and Antarctica are, are responding to a warming climate. So while sea level rise seems far away, since we're in the middle of the, of the country, shifts in weather are also shifts in weather that impact the, the ice sheets and are impacted by a change in Arctic regions. And so that's linked to the weather that we see here. In particular, sea ice concentration is the biggest change that we're seeing in the Arctic right now. 
bright white sea ice reflects a lot of incoming solar radiation, we've seen a huge decrease in the aerial extent of sea ice, let alone the thickness of the sea ice, which is another thing. That formation and melt of sea ice drives a lot of our ocean circulation, which is very important, uh, but also drives a lot of our weather patterns, uh, patterns that will impact Kansas. But at the end of the day, anthropogenic climate change is still sort of the underlying driver, right? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Greenland is not, would probably not be very stable in the climate that, you know, even with reduced anthropogenic warming, but it would be a very slow, slow change. It would lose mass, you know, very, very slowly. We are making these changes happen very quickly and in ways that, that in geologic time we have not seen before. So we can't look back, you know, 10,000 years ago and say, oh, well, you know, the last time they had a major shift, they did it this way. We can't look back that far because the rate of change for both the ocean and the atmosphere is much faster than we've seen before. And so when I started, Greenland in particular was kind of in balance with its current climate. You know, it was losing mass, but not quite as quickly as today. And that has really shifted in the past 20 years. Uh, it's really been accelerating its mass loss um, in ways that we understand and, and then in ways that are a little bit surprising uh, year to year in terms of what glaciers are accelerating and by how much and, and why. And so Greenland has reached a lot of headlines lately because of a lot of dramatic changes that have taken place.